Okay, we'll start uh, this afternoon's session with uh, Davidson Gomez. He got his undergraduate, his master's and PhD at UFMG, uh, all directed toward biochemical and molecular pharmacology. And during that, that time when he was doing um, at least his PhD, he started a collaboration with uh, this, uh, researchers, researchers in Yale, and that's continued until today. So he's still a visiting professor associated with Yale. Uh, he's now in the biochemistry and immunology department. Uh, he was the director of CAPU for a couple of years and he should be the uh, center of uh, bioimaging. I'll cut it short. So it's a bioimaging center with uh, several confocals and uh, light, light microscopes, cryostats, so uh, in, in CAPI, in the Biological Institute. His work focuses on signal transduction and its regulation of various cellular functions. He's uh, done a lot of calcium signaling and uh, uh, transmission, has a lot of experience with confocal fluorescent probes, teaches several classes in this area. And he also studies uh, more recently nanocomposites and their possible applications in regenerative medicine. So Davidson, um, thank you very much for participating. Uh, I'll turn it over to you. You can share your screen, please. Good afternoon. Can you hear me well, Greg? Yes, I can hear you here. Fine. Thank you very much to invite me out the organize for this talk. It's a great pleasure to be here today. And today I will I'll be talking about using super resolution microscopy to study nuclear calcium signaling. This talk is going to be mainly for students, so I will give a little bit more background about this field. So I first going to show you where I started. Uh, I started here at WetMG using this BioRad, very old BioRad 1024 to 2002, where I worked uh, until 2000, 2004. And then later, Michael Nathans from Yale University called me to work there in the same model of microscope where I could learn more about uh, several other techniques as well. And uh, because we use a lot of fluorescent probes, I'll, I would like to give a little bit the, uh, about uh, the, the history about uh, this field for the students. So uh, as you know, we use uh, a lot of fluorescent uh, probes and uh, several investigators report luminescence phenomena during the 70th and 18th centuries, but it was the scientists Sir George Stokes, who first described fluorescence in 1852 and was the guy responsible to, uh, to coin uh, this term uh, that, came, that came from this mineral that you can see here in the right side, and that's called fluorite. And here in the top, uh, the A panel, you can see this mineral when we illuminate the this mineral with a uh, standard sunlight. And in B, when we uh, illuminate this mineral with, uh, with UV light, we can see that going to flu fluoresce. And uh, later, Stokes also discovered that the wavelength shifts to longer values is the emission spectrum that bears his name that uh, today we call this phenomenon uh, Stokes shift, because today it's very well known that when we excite a molecule, uh, this molecule going to emit light in a longer wavelength. And the distance between the peak of the excitation, the emission today, we uh, know as Stokes shift. And, but light microscopy has a, uh, a drawback, one of them, some drawbacks, and one of them is the resolution that uh, uh, a little bit later I'm going to show you why we have this, uh, this barrier that are going to limit the resolution uh, of the size of, um, 
objects or molecules that we're going to observe. And uh, I'm going to show you the formula in a few minutes. But basically, have everything higher than 200, around 250 nanometers, we can observe and resolve well with uh, light mi microscopes. And uh, the microscopes that we are using these days to see uh, phenomena below of these limits, they call these uh, microscopes as super resolution microscopes, such as the GSD, SIM, STED, STORM, and so on. And today, uh, it's import important to say that we can uh, uh, resolve like molecules below of the this barrier that we're going to talk about uh, later. And but first of all, I need to uh, say a little bit what's resolution in this field. So the resolution of a, an optical microscope is defined as the shortest distance between two points on a specimen that can still be distinguished by the observer or camera system as separate entities. Uh, to be easier for the students to understand the limitations, I'm going to use most of this first part of the, of the talk, uh, images or representation of images of a spheres that were observed in light microscopes. And here in this figure, we can see some bits, fluorescent bits, uh, uh, how you, we can resolve in the limitations of uh, what we can see in, in the optical microscopes. For example, when we have two beads well apart, we can resolve, we can see here three beads that we can see clearly that are, 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 are representation of three beads. And uh, here, for example, we have like two beads that are too close, so we cannot, we cannot resolve uh, well, actually that uh, is two beads, when we uh, represent in 3D these X and Y images, we can see uh, some things like this. We can see that uh, don't, don't look like uh, perfect spheres. So we can see that the center has like a more, it's more fluorescent. And then we have these waves that we call these waves airy disks that I'm going to talk a little bit about these uh, uh, disks later as well. Here, uh, it's a better like a representation, good representation when we try to image like a perfect sphere in a light microscope. Let's say that this sphere has uh, exactly 200 nanometers. And in this range, uh, we can resolve in Y and X this, the size of this bead because in this uh, X, Y axis, we have a better resolution, but in the Z axis, we have like a two and a half times worse resolution. So uh, this is just to say that we have a different resolution in X and Y axis and another resolution in the Z axis. And this is important to know to resolve like a, a small objects below of this diffraction barrier in light microscopes. Here in the left side, actually, I put the two formulas about the AB resolution X and Y. That's the wavelength divided by two times the numeric aperture. And in Z, the AB resolution, you can see that that is two times the wavelength divided by the square root of the numeric aperture. So, when we try to build like small objects in 3D, we can need to be aware of this limitation in the Z direction. And this is very important to build like 3D images of uh, small objects uh, that were, were imaged in light microscopes. And this barrier, it's because of the glass that's used in the, the objectives to build the objectives. So the glass-based microscopes are further hampered by the final limit of optical resolution that's imposed by the diffraction of visible light wavefronts as they pass through the circular aperture at the rear focal plane of the objective. And here in the figure, maybe it's a little bit easier 
for the students to understand what happens. When we emit light through like a glass, part of this light is going to reflect. And this is going to form those like uh, air discs that uh, I showed you before in the image of uh, when we image like uh, perfect spheres in like microscopes. And of course, according to the amount of glass and the numeric aperture of the objective, we can resolve better on worse this object. object. So, uh, it's important to the students also to know that uh, there is a very important relationship between resolution and numeric aperture. And here in the left side, we can see here when we use a very small numeric aperture objective, such as with 0 0.2 uh, of uh, numeric aperture, you can see here that we cannot resolve well these spheres. Uh, but when we uh, image the same spheres using a, a high end uh, or with an objective with a high numeric aperture, we can resolve these objects much better, but we never see a perfect uh, sphere. We can see here that we see actually the center of the spheres very well, and then we start to see these um, air disks. And to calculate like an uh, image, uh, in super resolution microscopes that use like mathematical approach to resolve these objects, we need to get uh, get rid of of these uh, air disks. And uh, the numeric aperture of a microscope is a measure of the ability of the uh, of the ability to collect light and resolve fine samples details at the fixed distance from the object. And uh, so to make like a, a, a images in super resolution microscopes, we need to use like a objectives with a high numeric apertures, not those such as the ones that are listed here. But here there is another concept that's good to the students to know that uh, as high is the, is the numeric aperture of the, of, of the objective, uh, closer the objective going to be of this sample. So, and then here we can see very well three different objectives with three different um, numeric apertures. You can see this with a low numeric aperture going to work far away of the specimen, of the cover slip. And this one with a higher numeric aperture going to work much closer. And this one actually also going to give a better Resolution. And in super resolution microscopy, uh, most of these microscopes are going to fall in three main categories. Uh, the first one is, that's very common these days, days because uh, it's less expensive, is the SIM microscopes uh, that they structured illumination microscopy. And uh, also a, a very expensive one and very cool to work with is the STAD microscopes that they stimulate the emission depletion type. And here at the CAP at UFMG, we have a, a microscope that can do single molecule localization microscopy. And when we call like a palm or storm microscope, it's a kind of a single molecule localization mi microscope. So these are just uh, variations of the same kind of technique. In the structure illumination microscope, it's based on the excitation of the sample with a known spatially structure-like pattern and, and relies on the generation of interference patterns known, known as the Moif effect. And this gives us the lateral resolution that's uh, around two times better than the limit of, uh, a standard, of a standard microscope. And basically in these microscopes, we, can, uh, we have uh, in the beam path a grid that's going to give us this more effect. And then further on, this image needs to be processed to give us a better resolution. Here's uh, how it looks like uh, a SIM microscope. And this microscope, you can see that has two cameras and our microscope has some kind of limitation. One of the problems of the scene microscope 
microscopes that they collect they, they that they are very slow to collect images so this one that i chose to show to you an example of this kind of microscope has two cameras and uh, to improve uh, the time limitations the time frame limitation of this kind of microscope so collecting images uh, with two cameras might be of course faster than when we use a single camera Another one that's uh, one of the coolest microscopes in this field is the, is the STED microscopes. Just to make this theory very simple for the students, basically what you need to know very quickly that this microscope is going to work with two lasers. One is the standard excitation laser that uh, we found in uh, confocal microscopes. And, but we have a second laser that we call it uh, depletion laser. And uh, here in the right side, you can see a spot, the, uh, the beam of the, this excitation laser. And this depletion laser gives us a, like a donut shape illumination uh, pattern. And basically when these two lasers interact with each other, we're going to get like a, a better uh, PSF, that's the point spread function, that when we cross a line in those like um, uh, uh, representation of uh, illuminated spheres with uh, those peaks and the area disks. So you can see here that we see a single dot and we don't see anymore that those uh, area disks. And in C panel, we can see how the same like image looks like in a wide field uh, microscope compared to the stair. What's uh, very interesting in, uh, uh, about this microscope when we work with them that like uh, as quick we get the, this image uh, in the wide field mode, we get the stair image because it's a physical way to get like a super resolution images. So actually it's the type of uh, super resolution that I like the most, but it's the most extensive as well. <laughs> and uh, here it's the microscope that I used for two years at uh, Yale University. This uh, is how it looks like a STED microscope. In this box in the left side has all the standard excitation lasers. Actually this one has a single laser, it's a white laser that uh, can, uh, ex uh, we can choose in which wavelength we can excite the sample. So this is a very cool laser to work with. And below of this white laser, we have like a three ab ablation lasers that we can choose to do it like a triple stand labeling. And these are kind of stand uh, that can do like a, a 3D images as well that I'm not going to talk about these details today to not confuse the students about uh, how uh, this works. But this works as a confocal system and as well as a stand. And when we talk as about single molecule localization microscopes, uh, these microscopes, uh, we need to prepare the samples to make the probes to blink. So we need to choose, first of all, a probe that's able to blink in a, uh, in a special buffer that I'm not going to say the details today for you. But uh, we do a kind of time course and we need to excite uh, this sample in this buffer that's going to make the probability of the probes to blink. And then we collect like a several images such as in B, shown in B, C, D, and E. So in every image, you're going to see some dots blinking. And then later, uh, using computer approach, software approach, we combine all the images to uh, reconstruct like a tubulin um, uh, uh, in a immunofluorescence, for example. So that's how more or less how it works. And here we can see a representation how an image in a storm uh, microscope going to improve like a, a image of microtubules in a adherent cell. So here we can see uh, how it, it looks like in a standard white field or confocal microscope. And in C, we can see very well the micro, microtubules well resolved. So 
these uh, e and these microscopes can give us easily today a uh, resolution around 20 nanometers. They stand it's two times worse, more or less. But today, on top of uh, this uh, reconstruction, we can use deconvolution, and then we can improve very easily uh, at least two times the resolution of the single molecule localization images. And this is the like uh, that we have here at a CAP UFMG that can do uh, either TERF or single molecule uh, images. And basically here, what's the most important part of this system compared to uh, like a wide field microscope is this camera that I pointed to you here in this slide. And uh, for this kind of system, we need a fast and sensitive camera. This camera has a quantum efficiency of uh, 95% and can collect the image like a thousand images per second. So that's necessary to collect the, uh, the, the events of the probes blinking in real time. So basically, when we are doing images through this microscope, we just see dots blinking, and then uh, later on we uh, reconstruct the images uh, to make it like uh, the, the the final image. And this is just to give a little bit of background and about super resolution microscope. And then now in this second uh, section of my talk. I'm going to talk uh, about what I did with this technology to answer uh, questions in my field. So when I started, started in this uh, field, I started to be passionate about calcium signaling. That's because uh, it's well known that calcium can trigger several cellular processes. And I was very uh, curious uh, when I was a student how a single ion can trigger in the same cell sometimes, uh, in some points, proliferation, sometimes senescence, sometimes cell death, and sometimes differentiation. How a single ion could do such a, a, a broad range, controls a broad range of cellular process. And then today, of course, we know that this is possible because these uh, calcium signals can be shaped in space, time, and amplitude. In some cells, for example, can generate like uh, uh, waves, such as I'm showing here in the left side. Some cells can have through some agonies uh, oscillatory pattern. And what I become more interested throughout my career that sometimes what probably happens uh, mainly in physiology that we have very specific gradients. Sometimes these gradients are very specific to the cytoplasm or only at, going to happen at the plasma membrane, but uh, happens also in the nucleoplasma as well. So I became very interested to know how it's possible to generate signals here. And uh, in that time when I started in this field was, a, was not well known the functions of the nuclear calcium. Uh, in general, how calcium can regulate cell prolif proliferation? What we know very well about how this ion can control cell proliferation. For example, we have growth factors such as uh, uh, hepatocyte growth factor, uh, epidermal growth factors that are ligands uh, that going to trigger uh, RTKs receptors in kinase. These receptors, once activated by the ligand, these receptors going to autophosphorylate. And uh, when these receptors autophosphorylates, going to trigger a cascade of phosphorylation that's going to activate PLC. Uh, the one that I'm representing here that's important is the gamma that's found at the cytoplasm. And uh, phospholipase C, going to be the enzyme response to, to make the hydrolysis of PP2, the phosphatidyl, inositol 45, generating two other lipids, such as the diacyl glycerol, that's going to be at the plasma membrane, 
and I was going to generate the IP3, the 1451. This IP3 can trigger its receptor at the ER compartment. And ER, it's a compartment that has very high concentration of calcium. So once we trigger this IP3 receptor, calcium can flow from ER to the cytoplasm. And this calcium is going to be able to trigger uh, calcium binding proteins. Some of them are going to be important to, uh, to control uh, cell proliferation. What I'm going to show you today that uh, the same signaling that's very well known to happen in the cytoplasm also can happen in the nucleoplasm. So throughout of this project, uh, I use like super resolution to answer a few questions, such as what structures are responsible for releasing calcium in the nucleus? Uh, also, how can RTKs regulate the release of calcium from the nuclear stocks? And today, I'm not going to show it to you because the time limitations, but I use this uh, super resolution images also to show how calcium uh, can regulate cell proliferation and tumor growth. So to start showing images, I'm going to show a little bit what I did uh, with uh, uh, about what structures are responsible for the releasing of calcium in the nucleus. Uh, this field still we still have many questions, and the nuclear compartment it's a very interesting compartment. And most of you know that the nuclear in the envelope is a double bilayer. So, and the IP3 receptors that uh, I showed to you that's very important to release cells from the ER. Today, we know that this IP3 receptor can be found in the inner nuclear membrane and can be found as well in these imaginations of the inner nuclear membrane that also some people call it uh, the nucleoplasmic reticulum. That's basically the imaginations of the inner nuclear membrane. And sometimes because the cell, some cells might form these imaginations, the IP3 receptors can be found in the uh, outer nuclear membrane, but inside of these imaginations. As you can see here, because the uh, cells can uh, diffuse throughout of the nuclear pores, if uh, this IP3 receptor is going to be triggered, the, the calcium can be released from these IP3 in the outer nuclear envelope membranes and can get inside of the nucleus. But uh, in B here, I, I can, uh, okay, you can observe that also throughout of these IP3 receptors that are present in the, in the inner nuclear uh, uh, envelope membranes can release calcium. Because as I showed to you, they are, uh, it's an important stock of calcium, and because they are these are contiguous with the inner uh, the nuclear envelope membrane, so the cells can reach the nuclear interior throughout of the IP3 receptors present in the inner nuclear membrane. So I did a lot of uh, super resolution images to show uh, that's uh, the case in some cells, or this can happen as well in other cells, and. Of course, I start these uh, doing images in this field, for example, using the microscope that I showed to you in the beginning of this presentation, that was a BioR 1024. And uh, also in that time, the two photon microscope was a nice tool to get, uh, to get uh, improved resolution. And same using like a, a two photon uh, microscopes, we can see here like a cell loaded with a ER tracker and here is the, uh, the nucleus of uh, one cell. And we can see clear that this cell has a very uh, like a deep imaginations of the inner and outer nuclear envelope membrane. And here in the B panel, I did three sections of the same cell to show how these move throughout of the nuclear interior. So today we know that here in these structures, we can uh, find IP3 receptors as well. 
And because of time limitation, I'm going to show you a lot of these, uh, a lot of images or videos because uh, the, these uh, presentations are already too heavy. But now I'm going to show a little bit about what endogenous factors activate this calcium signaling pathway in the nucleus and how I use super resolution for that. And of course, when I started in this field, I used like a, a, a confocal uh, my microscopes uh, to make images of, for example, the HDF receptor that's also known as a CNET receptor. That's the labeling that you can see here in green. In red is the uh, lamin B1, that's a protein that's found in the inner nuclear envelope membrane. In blue here, it's a DAP staining uh, just to see the nuclear interior. And I did two conditions here. The top images are before uh, stimulation, and uh, the bottom images are after to stimulate the cells with HGF. The most important image is the uh, this one, the right side, the bottom right, uh, that we can see after to stimulate the cells with HGF, we can find much more HGF receptors in the nuclear interior. And because, uh, as you remember that I showed to you, that uh, RTKs can generate calcium, my challenge uh, initially in this project was not only to show that RTKs can be found here, but I had to prove that all the other signaling molecules uh, could be found in the nuclear interior as well to generate calcium. Uh, and we show that uh, these are the translocation of RTKs to the nucleus. It's a, a common phenomenon uh, for this family of receptors. Later, my wife and I, my wife, Michelle Rodriguez, uh, we showed that our uh, insulin receptor also translocates in primary hepatocytes. And this was a cover of the hepatology in 2008 that we gave like a, a new function for the insulin receptors uh, originally in this paper, showing that this kind of uh, the insulin receptor can move from cytoplasm or plasma membrane, uh, can reach the nuclear interior to trigger like a cell proliferation. And this was a, a nice uh, demonstration what this receptor can do as well. And here I'm showing you these images because later I'm going to uh, show to you how this image that I took some of them almost 10 years ago, how this compare with the image that we can collect in super resolution microscopes. And in that time, of course, to convince people we did like a very fine Z stacks. And uh, here uh, I'm using the, uh, the ligand and I prove the ligand moves with the receptor as well. But here in green is the ligand labeled with uh, Alexa 48. And after stimulation, you can see that the ligand can be found in the nuclear interior in, throughout of the uh, top or left side, right side showing the the z stacks reconstruction, like uh, here where I point are three clusters of the ligands that can uh, be, could reach the nuclear interior. And the first kind of a super resolution microscope that we use to compare the previous images and with uh, the super resolution ones was the uh, using the air scanner from Zeiss. We bought this microscope here like in 2015. Uh, uh, this microscope going to use a detector with 32 PMTs. And in the center of, uh, uh, of this detector, we collect more light with less resolution. And in the edges, we, has, we have less light and higher resolution. And uh, who is the from the time that uh, study a lot of uh, confocal know that when we decrease the pinhole for uh, uh, from units is smaller than one air unit, we lost a lot of uh, signal. The signal to noise ratio uh, gets worse. And what uh, this uh, detector uh, does uh, collect images in each of uh, of these PMTs with zero point two. Air units. 
And then this mathematically can combine the signals from several of these arrays to give us an improved resolution uh, that's uh, 1.7 times better than standard confocal. And here it's an image in the confocal. We can see a fish uh, image, a probe, uh, looking like uh, segments of the chromatin. And here the arrow points like a green spot that's very weak. But when we collect the same image in the area, we can see actually that we can uh, see the green dot very well. And actually it's not only one dot, are uh, two dots. So I use this uh, super resolution kinds of microscope to see better how the ligand, going to, uh, the EGF ligand, the ligand for EGF receptor going to be the nuclear interior. We can see after like a 40 minutes of stimulation in green going to be the EGF uh, again with Alexa 48. And we can see that are like these clusters uh, when we compare the image after 5, 10, 20 or 40 minutes, this cluster is going to increase in size. And But uh, I'm not going to show you today, but the, the amount of clusters remain constant from uh, the beginning. So looks like uh, uh, the ligand has like a specific parts of the, the nucleus that uh, can reach. And then this cluster just gets bigger uh, when we keep the stimulation. And this was a uh, work done by Camila Faraco, that was one of my master degree students that uh, today she's doing a PhD in Canada. And of course, we did biochemistry to prove all this. So we uh, do a lot of biochemistry as well. I just show you uh, these biochemists just to uh, prove to you a little bit that uh, we did several other kinds of experiments to show the same points. And here, for example, EGF receptor, when we do uh, nuclear fractionations in the nuclear compartment, also follows what we saw in the images. So the peak, of course, is the same. And this uh, kind of uh, phenomena happens not only in tumor cell lines, but also in primary cells as well, such as hepatocytes. And this was the first image uh, that I did using the STEM microscope to see how this compare with the images that uh, we did like uh, in the confocal. If we compare, see this in the Z direction, as I showed to you in the beginning of my talk, the resolution in the Z direction is two, uh, at least two times worse, two and a half times worse. So we see this shape. Uh, I was aware in this time that this was a distortion of, uh, of the limitation of the light microscopes. But when I use like a stand in, in, in its best, we can see here, that I can re could resolve much better the clusters of ligands, and I could see much easier and that the, the 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 ligands was more concentrated at the what we can see together here with red. That's the lumin B. That's a uh, uh, inner nuclear envelope membrane marker, and we could quantify this through this image. But we can see through step microscope we saw a, a much clearer result. So this is something that's uh, very impressive when we use like super resolution microscopes. And also uh, I, I use super resolution microscope to show that PIP2 is present at the nucleus. That's the lipid that's necessary to generate IP3 and then to trigger the release of calcium from ER. And uh, this was a very deep preparation uh, imagine that uh, today, what's it, there are antibodies for lipids. So I use an antibody, a uh, very small antibody, to, that can detect PIP2. In green, in green here, you can see PIP2. And here in red, the lumin B1 stain again. So what's fascinating about this, uh, very interesting about this image, that I was expecting the PIP2 to be bound at the uh, lumin B and be more uh, close related with the membrane as supposed to be. But it uh, looks like there is a lot of PIP2 at the nucleoplasm. 
if this is an artifact or not, I don't know, but it's interesting anyway. And I did biochemistry as well to show the same point. I use dot blots. I'm not showing the dot blots, but uh, uh, we can see the hydrolysis of PIC2 in the nuclear compartment much easier uh, through biochemistry. And uh, this was published in 2008. And just to show you a little bit what I did about the, the traditional calcium signaling uh, work. So at Yale, I generated uh, two constructs, one that can bind to or compete with IP3 in the cytoplasm, because this constant is going to be with the nuclear exclusion signal, or this IP3 buffer construct can move to the nucleus because it has three nuclear localization signals. That was a constant I did myself to show that we can really generate calcium with the nucleus. And this image uh, here uh, in our left side, it's a cell loaded with a flu 4 a.m. That's a probe that binds to calcium. When this happens, uh, the fluorescence of this probe increase according to this scale. And of course, the constant that I did was with a, a red fluorescent protein. Here we can see with uh, the construct with the uh, tagged with a nuclear exclusion signal going to be only in the cytoplasm, and the one with the nuclear localization signal going to be just in the nucleus. So when we stimulate the cells with HGF, these cells with HGF, we can see that we're with the uh, cytosolic type 3 buffer, we could see the calcium increase, but this would not be observed when uh, the nuclear IP3 buffer was used. So suggesting that part of this calcium signal could really happen in the nuclear interior. Of course, I did like uh, quantifications of this compartment. I showed through graphs, through graphs as well. And just to summarize a little bit what I showed to you. So I showed to you that uh, HGF, EGF, insulin, increase IP3 and calcium with the nucleus. And because uh, the, our time is short, I'm going to summarize a little bit what I did and some of the what I'm going to summarize here, I had unfortunately no time to show to you today. But uh, we are working as uh, more than 10 years ago with the hypothesis that uh, RTKs can uh, translocate from plasma membrane through the nucleus Today, we know a lot how this happens. So there is a retrograde kind of uh, translocation. This receptor moves, ba moves back to ER, to Golgi, ER, and reach the nuclear interior. And there are two hypotheses. One that can move uh, through the nuclear pores. And there is another interesting hypothesis as well that this receptor can move besides of the nuclear pores as well. And uh, we have been showing throughout of this year that the nucleus has all the machinery to generate IP3, include PIP2, PLCs, uh, we can uh, generate and activate PKC, and the IP3 uh, releases calcium in the nuclear interior, and this calcium, it's important to bind to calcium binding proteins that are going to trigger mainly two cell cycle phase, one is the transition from G1 to uh, S phase, and another important checkpoint that calcium works uh, in this uh, signaling test is the transition from G2 to mitosis. And I, I would like to end this talk and uh, saying thank you again for the organizers of uh, this event to invite me for this talk. And uh, all my Brazilian collaborators, there are a lot of them and students that were very important uh, for this work. My, uh, our collaborators from other universities as well, such as Yale. Um, uh, my great appreciation to Michael Nathan's without him, most of this work uh, could not be possible. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, David. Some very, very, very interesting. So uh, let me look here one second to see how many. There were a few questions here. 
Um, can you stop? There we go. So Davidson um, uh, Valeria asks, how does this nuclear calcium signal differ in mono or binucleated hepatos uh, hepatocytes? It seems to me that one nuclei is staying more than the other. Well, that's a very interesting question, Greg. And uh, we know that hepatocytes can have uh, multiple uh, nuclei, and, uh, but we never did anything specifically to like to image and to compare what happens in hepatocytes with one nuclei compared to hepatocytes with two nuclei. But uh, this is something that could be very interesting to do. What about the, the invagination? So the difference between the unstimulated and the stimulated, do you see more invaginations? And I would suppose you would see more invaginations. Do those, is there a flux when you do treatment? The invaginations, mm -hmm. uh, the formation of these invaginations are not something that we can observe uh, like quick. Uh, what I, I can say that uh, there are cells, for example, neurons, many neurons, does not have any vagination at all. And some cells, mainly like uh, uh, cancer cells, going to have much more invaginations. And of course, what happens as well, that's interesting. Uh, if you like uh, induce cells to die and you can uh, generate this invagination, but this takes like uh, at least several minutes or sometimes hours. But when the cells start to die, it's easily to, to see the formation of this invagination. But in this point, of course, all the organelles are in process to be dis, uh, disrupted as well. Uh, do we have any other questions from the audience? I have a question, if I may. OK. Hi, Davidson. Thank you for the talk. Um, I'd, I'd like to go back. To the methods, the method parts of your talk, you, you talked about two different types of super resolution where you essentially use a laser to Im improve the effective um, airy disk width or the, the effective point spread function. You talked about stimulated uh, depletion and, and then the, the ground state depletion. Um, I, I, I don't know if I missed it, but do you have any? to say about the relative benefits uh, or weaknesses of the two techniques? Yes, that's uh, thank you very much for this question, Chris. Well, what I like the most about STED micros microscopy that we can get like a, a, a instantaneous image. It's as quick we generate like a, a image in a wide field microscope, we generate the image in the STED microscope. But the limitation, the biggest limitation of STED, that this laser has very high power. So it's it's necessary high power to make this STED effect. And it's very easy to destroy the cells through STED. So it's necessary to increase the power in a range that starts to become uh, very easy to destroy all your preparation. So these days, there are kinds of a new STED microscope that they call it like a resolve it or resolve like a STED that's going to trigger the laser just in a specific points of, uh, of, the, of the image where actually there is the excitation and uh, to control better the power of the laser in a quantum way. Uh, and this improves the limitations and the, but the other limitation of STED that's very expensive microscope. It's uh, two times, three times more expensive than the other microscopes. Uh, there's another question here. Have you checked the expression of cyclins A and B1? Yes, we checked the expression of these cyclins. And as uh, I showed in the, the summary slide, and basically when we block like a uh, nuclear calcium, we can block the expression of these cyclins. So we measure by Western blocks, mainly uh, the expression of these cyclins. 
Okay, there's also another another one. Have you checked the expression of H, uh, HGFR or uh, EGFR during prometaphase in nuclear envelope vesicles during mitosis? Yes, actually, what's interesting, uh, when we block nuclear calcium, the cell is going to be impaired exactly in prometaphase. So, looks like what happens that uh, nuclear calcium is going to be important for the phosphorylation, as I showed to you, can trigger P PKC. And PKC, it's important to phosphorylate the lamins. And when this happens, the nuclear envelope is going to be phosphorylated and then going to destroy the nuclear envelope to cell to progress, uh, to evolve to a uh, metaphase. So when we block like the nuclear calcium, the cells going to be exactly in pro metaphase, exactly the point that uh, the nuclear envelope is still intact. Very good. Uh, okay, uh, any other questions? Okay, Davidson, thank you very much. I think it was very good. Uh, we'll only say that Davidson is in, uh, still involved in CAPI. He's not the director, but he is probably willing to help anyone that has or wants to. And I'm not sure about the class schedule there, but I suppose there will be uh, classes or training sessions soon on using the super resolution, the Leica microscope that's in, in the center in ECB. Thanks exactly. again. Thank you, Greg. Thank you all. Okay.